plugging it back in. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Artist Alchemy. My name is Alex Asina, and I am here today with quite the panel of people. This this way, I guess, reverse uh, mirror things and whatnot. Uh, and we're going to be talking today about D and D and how it relates to art and all things D and D inspired. I'm super excited. I'm super passionate about D and D, and I know all my friends are here too. Uh, so first off, let's just do some introductions, uh, going around the circle, and um, let's just say your name where you're currently at and uh if you play a character what that character currently is or if you don't say like i'm the dungeon master and i played everything so all right let's start with shantae all right here i am uh i'm shantae arroyo and uh i'm currently in yuba city california and my character right now is rain and she's a ranger yes cool mm -hmm. ranger rain uh <laughs> let's go down to london Hello, my name is London. Uh, I'm currently in Missoula, Montana, where it's uh, pretty snowy and rainy. I kind of love it. Um, I play with a character named Llewellyn Page. Um, he's an arcane trickster rogue. He's pretty awesome. <laughs> he is. That's arcane trickster rogue. All right, and next up, let's go to Josh. Hi, uh, I'm Josh, he, him. I'm uh, in Glendora, New Jersey, and all the stories you hear about New Jersey are true but worse. Um, and, uh, I, I'm the dungeon master and I play everything as, as I was told to say, yeah, uh, I'm, the, I'm the dungeon master in, um, nine D and D campaigns right now, as well as the storyteller in a vampire, the masquerade campaign and uh, an uncharted worlds campaign. And I'm the player in a cyberpunk red campaign. And my player, I, I'm a player. I can. So my character there is a, yeah. a, net, a net runner. I know this is completely unrelated, but I'm saying it anyway, yes. <laughs> a, a net runner named Dino Jack. Yes, Dino Jack. I love Dino that. Jack. Mm. Yeah, and for those of you that don't know me, I'm Alex Cecina. I am in Boston, Massachusetts right now, and uh, I am also a DM for one very cool campaign. And then I play in two others, and currently my character's name is Jacques Lapidou, and he is a blade singer, rogue elf. Oh. Yeah. Blade singer. Blade singer. You know, yeah, trying yeah. to... It's uh, yeah. Tasha's, Tasha's, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so good. So good. Anyway, Bye. so if all of that was complete gibberish to you, that's okay. We're here kind of today to explain a little bit about what this is and what we just said. Um, so I'm going to start this off by like asking everyone what D&D is to them. Um, let's start with Josh in this case. Sure. Um, d d is an outlet for me for shared storytelling. Uh, in my mind, storytelling is why I got into theater. It's why I got into everything I do. I love telling stories. I love telling stories with people. I love being creative and making people happy. And d d does all of that. Um, I always tell people playing to assume that pick, think of yourself as the main character in a fantasy story uh and so it's really just an opportunity for people to just kind of like explore in this beautiful world in this beautiful space with no limits uh it's just an opportunity to be creative and uh play a game with friends ideally in person around, around a table but we'll get back to that when the time comes <laughs> yeah. that's a whole thing right now we'll talk a little bit more more about that later um how that currently works in our situation as it is mm -hmm. Uh, Shantae, what is D&D what is D&D to you? Uh, D&D to me is an open forum where you get to create your own world and you get to be whatever you want to be. It's uh, honestly, I think one of the most beautiful things about it and why um, RPG games in, in general are just so popular because it's really just whatever, whatever kind of story you want to tell, whatever character you want to be without limitations, that's what you can do. Um, and it's a nice break from reality. Yes. Ain't that the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, London, what about you? I would echo a lot of what Shantae said in terms of just being able to create and do like whatever. Like it, I mean, if you play D&D &D, and if you really want someone to understand d and I think what you need to tell them is that this is your story. You can do whatever you want. You can attempt to do whatever you want. Yeah. And, you know, you can influence the story however you want. And I think that that is really a, a beautiful thing. And, you know, I, I'm someone who really likes storytelling games, games that are like The Last of Us or Until Dawn or Detroit, you know, those games are some of my favorite games. And so I like the ability to make big choices that are meaningful and there's like, there's no choice, there's no game where those choices are more meaningful than in D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. And then just the opportunity to be able to do that with 
a group of friends and to experience what that is to create a story with a group of friends, I think is, is really amazing. Mm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Um, and that's the beauty of D and D all those things that you said are completely true. Like, right. Um, and today we're using kind of D and D as kind of like a general, um, thing, uh, it is not necessarily D just D&D that we will be talking about, but tabletop uh, RPGs in general, or if you see it later in the stream, TTRPGs. Um, we're going to be talking about all of that and more. So D&D uh, &D is just the over-branching umbrella that we are currently using today, um, just because it is the probably the most mainstream source that uh, more people are going to be familiar with than some of the smaller things, uh, say uh, Starfinder or uh, the Vampire what was the vampire one, Josh? Vampire the Masquerade. Vampire the Masquerade. I was gonna say Vampire Masquerade. I was pretty close. I just very got, close. Uh, you know, uh, but yes, all these things uh, are storytelling and just so much more. Uh, but that kind of brings us into our next question here about what makes D and D art. Because a lot of people that are gonna be watching this are not gonna be familiar with what D and D is as a whole. Um, and we said it's all these storytelling things and like that. But there's so much more to D and D than just the storytelling. Um, I know there's woodworking and, and you make the minis and you paint the minis. So tell me tell me what your art is that you put into D&D. &D. Let's start with London this time. I think the the, the way I view, I view d and D's art is just the idea that you're creating a story that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I think that that's really powerful, you know, and that's kind of what, what I was talking about before is, you know, I feel like I've been really blessed with a, with an excellent top-notch dungeon master who really knows how to lead, you know, our party in a way that is really exciting. And, you know, the story flows. And I feel like if he wanted to go back and if he wanted to record our sessions and go back and actually put pen to paper, he could write that out. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like... You look at D and D, at least for me, before I ever played. You know, you look you look at it on television, and you think, "Oh, these guys are playing this nerdy game that I don't really understand." There's like dice involved. There's these little miniatures that are involved. There's like a book or something, and it all looks kind of cool, but somehow confusing. But when you really get into it, it's really just about creating that story, and I think that's what's most meaningful to me. You know, and the fact that that story is transcribable or potentially transcribable to other mediums. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Love that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So cool. Shante, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think the creative writing element is definitely super important and is really what makes, makes D and D D and D. However, I also have to say that the acting and performance of it all is equally as important because, you know, you, if you have a, a bunch of people that really aren't hamming it up and being silly and performing their characters, um, the whole thing may be just a little bit one note. But if you have people that are getting into it, they're in first person character and they are who they are in that moment. It just you get lost into this world. You know, you are that that character. And that performance aspect, I think, is what draws a lot of theater kids <laughs> to D&D. &D. I tend to find them uh, quite often in this world. So it's just the acting part. I think that's a huge part of it. Ray raise your hand if you're a theater kid. Yeah, there it is. I figured, you know, it's, yeah, I, I would have to completely 100% agree. I think that's what's, uh, honestly, I'm just going to speak this real quick. Bef uh, this is literally what's getting me through the pandemic at this point, because like, this is my acting outlet. This is my creative outlet. Um, so having all this right now is so healing and refreshing in and of this moment. So mm. thank you, Tabletop RPGs. Mm. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, Josh, what makes D and D art to you? I mean, the thing is, there's no like wrong answer to this because uh, I, I with everything that like London and Shantae were saying, like, yeah, yeah, that's good because it's absolutely true. Like, it's it is a story. You ca you can't say that uh, theater isn't art and say that D and D isn't. You can't say that, uh, that storytelling is art and, and D and D isn't. Uh, I have a D and D cookbook and I've been making meals from this D and D cookbook. Cooking is an art. Like you, you mentioned, painting miniatures. Every aspect of D and D is art. Uh, it's just because it's for a smaller audience doesn't make it any less legitimate. Mm. Um, so so, or any less, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, yeah. I might have phrased that wrong. Um, so, like for me, like yeah, it's an acting thing. I do lots of character voices and lots of storytelling. I have to draw battle maps. I have 
stacks of hundreds of battle maps down in stairs. Uh, I've backed pretty much every Kickstarter for like these cool like the 3D battle map books that are gorgeous. Just incredible works yeah. of art. This, the thing is, D&D isn't just one art form. It's tons of art forms that all go together to create this beautiful like masterpiece. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I completely agree. Um, like, yes, we've touched on the acting, the creative writing side, and yes, there's mini painting, but also like there's so much more to it. And even um, I know personally, like when I look on Twitter, um, people commission to have their characters drawn, um, yeah. which is huge. You know, you're paying an artist in that moment to create something in your fantasy game and that's great and then there's also like people that get into it also want like their swords made for like their character or stuff like that we're getting blacksmiths involved you get uh word workers who make these dice vaults and these other trays and holders and stuff like that and it's just like there's so many different little outlets for this um that just all go into art and then filter into this uh tabletop world that we live in and i think it's amazing so there's your explanation, people. D&D is art. Welcome to Artist Alchemy, where we have now confirmed this theory. <laughs> Put it's it like to rest. <laughs> no yeah. one ever has to debate it again. If you were ever in doubt. <laughs> yep. Not anymore. Um, but along all those lines, I, we were just talking about all these things. And Josh, you mentioned Kickstarter. Um, there are so many cool small businesses that kind of come from this. In fact... Huh, we were talking about something right before the stream started. Josh, would you care to elaborate on uh, maybe a small business that you might know about? Yeah, it's called Eldritch Foundry. Uh, they do miniatures. Uh, no, okay, um, uh, they, Okay. in all seriousness, actually, really quick, while I just said them, Eldritch Foundry does make custom miniatures. It's like the small business version of Hero Forge. Give them some love. Their minis are excellent quality. Mm. Anyway, uh, that okay. aside... Um, you were referring to me. Uh, I play. I run D and D games professionally. It's called D and D for Hire. Uh, it is my full time job uh, as a for almost a year now, um, and that's that keeps the roof over my head. I run mostly for kids, but I have an adult group too, and I have some kids that are getting into like college age, which is really weird. Um, I've been like watching them grow up. I've been doing. I've been playing the same uh, with the same groups of kids. Some of these groups for two and a half, three and a half years now. Um, right. And uh, it started as a small thing, and it's been slowly growing. And now it's uh, it supports me, and I have a couple of other employees who are making money off of D and D too. Uh, so that's that's my li it's my whole life right now. It's my entire uh, li livelihood. That's what I do. Yes, look at that. How much do you, much do you charge for that? Um, so it is twenty dollars per player per session. Um, that's not bad. I don't that's think so. Good, that's a good deal. They're they're two hour sessions though. Um, typically with adult groups, uh, especially if it's like someone I know, I'll like push it. I'll like run it a bit longer with my kid groups. It's usually school school oriented, so I kind of cut it off rigidly at two hours. But adult groups, I'll like I'll slide some extra minutes if we're in the middle of a fight or something like that. Um, but yeah, so it, it varies. Um, the I guess the prices vary, but yeah, it's it's a really I think it's a cool opportunity. I have a lot of fun with it and people keep coming back. So I guess I'm doing something right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Success. I mean, I love that you've uh, found this opportunity to uh, ex do something that you love and Thank it's you. so cool. Um, Josh was actually my uh, first official DM, I would say. Um, yeah. Uh, the stories that we could tell, like he put up with so much crap from me <laughs> as a player. Um, yeah, I, uh, was not the easiest player. I think, I think in both of the campaigns that you ran for me, I kind of went against the grain a little bit of what everyone else was doing. Can I tell you, I was having so much trouble just today of getting a player to be the opposite because I have a very goody two shoes player who got possessed by an evil object and he was not having it. He did not want to role play evil. So I'm like, he's like, oh, I say this. I'm like, you can't. You like, cause he's like, I, it was, it's an, uh, an evil hand basically. And as long yeah. as it's on his wrist, it controls him. Uh, or once it makes him do evil things. So he's like trying to like, he's like, I like look down at my hand and make a motion across my throat. I'm like, you can't do that. You can't suggest that you want your character to get the hand cut off. Uh, so he was like pulling teeth to try and get him to be like, no, you, this is the role playing part of it, friend. You gotta be evil right now. <laughs> Wow. You if made only, this choice three yeah. times. <laughs> yeah, I was I was you tried to make me good at one point in one of the campaigns and I did not take that well either. So I remember that part. But see the difference is you leaned into it. You put on a yes. suit of armor that turned you lawful good and you played it so well that it forced the other players to rip it off you because you were being too nice for the final boss fight. Ooh. Yeah. It's what I do. <laughs> Just gotta be messy somehow. 
Can't be too easy. Uh, but let's talk about other small businesses. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, that was fun reminiscing Great, for that moment. Uh, London, what uh, what small businesses have you kind of seen out there that are cool and neat for tabletop RPGs? I think what I've really seen, and you talked about art being commissioned, and you know we play with an artist. Shantae's sister is actually an artist that plays with us, and she, on multiple occasions, has rendered our characters into actual art. Um, and I mean, I'm always telling her that she needs to sell her artwork more and put herself out there more often because she's a fantastic artist. But I, I mean, that's really the side of D and D that I really see. And just like you're talking about, I could totally see, you know, more DMs going out and you know, charging people for the services. You know, I think that there are a lot of people out there who want to play D and D, who just don't know <laughs> what's going on. Like they don't know about the dice, they don't know how it works. And they just want, I, I, was, I was literally having a conversation last night with a friend who didn't know I played D&D, who asked me, hey, would you ever want to play D&D? I, I want to get into it. And I was like, uh, yeah, I want to play D&D. Let's do it. Let's figure it out. Let's get some people together and let's make it happen. And so um, I think there's definitely money to be made there, especially for, you know, some of the little people. Mm. Yeah, definitely. That's. Oh, so cool. Good, good perspective on that. Shantae, what are some small businesses that you've seen? Uh, so many. First, I will say, if you do want a commission from my sister, uh, hit me up. Let me know. Yeah. <laughs> also, I mean, honestly, I am on Etsy uh, at least every other day just looking around. And I run into so many artists who are creating some really cool stuff. I mean, just the other day, I saw like a spell tracker in the form of a scroll. It's like a little oh. contraption where you can keep track of it. And like, of course, all the handmade dice you can find, handmade tables even. Uh, I mean, there's so much to explore just on Etsy alone. Never mind going into, you know, D&D groups on Facebook. You can always find people there, you know, peddling whatever amazing thing they've created. So it's just everywhere. Yeah. Speaking of uh, dice, though. If you have your shiny rocks next to you, pull them out. I'm just gonna dump a couple of these into my hand. Oh my god! Oh no! I lost control. <laughs> Me too. That's okay. So this is what D and D. This is how most uh, tabletop RPGs operate. We have shiny dice. Shiny so dice. many goblin rocks. And once you start collecting, you cannot stop. Can't this stop. is there's more. There's there's always more, and there's always another set that you want to grab. Um, <laughs> and there's metal ones, there's plastic ones, there's one with cool designs inside, there's ones that are different shapes, like a spell or uh, like a spell scroll or like a, a hammer. Like there's so many different things out there. Yeah. Um, and it's just like people getting creative with these things and everything. But uh, let's talk a little bit about, this isn't in my uh, questionnaire, but let's talk a little bit about the mechanics of how uh, uh, tabletop RPGs work. So everything's happening creative story-wise, yes, but... What, how is the, are things decided? Does the DM just kind of like, no, that doesn't succeed. I don't want that to happen. Um, let's talk about chance and probability. I think, Josh, you're probably one of the more qualified people. So why don't you go ahead and give us an explanation on that? Oh, boy. Uh, really quick, actually, before we move on from cool small yeah. businesses, um, while we're shameless plugging, one more. Um, this is not a business, but um, my sister has started painting miniatures recently. And like I wouldn't say this without like 100% certainty. She is so freaking talented like the minis she paints are absolutely gorgeous she did her first like set of six commissioned minis and they're like amazing so if anyone needs minis painted you let me know too because uh we i know i know a guy and the guy is my sister <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, okay, okay good to know good to know um mecha mechanically um what was the question <laughs> yeah no um how mechanically how would you like things how are things decided in tabletop rpgs okay. like Probability and chance and whatnot. So the, the role of the dice is incredibly important. Um, there's seven different dice in a D&D game, uh, though typically you're only going to use like six of them. And the main one is the D20, 20-sided uh, 20 die. So with D&D specifically, anything your character wants to do that is more difficult than just like, I open a door. You don't need a roll to open a door. But if you're like, I'm going to like jump this eight foot gap. Well, okay, you're going to roll for it. And everyone has like, everyone's characters have bonuses or penalties or things they're better at, but you always roll this. And uh, the higher you get, the better you do. Uh, usually the dungeon master 
master has a uh, set number in their head of like a number they have to beat. Uh, and then you need to roll the die and try to beat that. And sometimes the number can be exorbitantly high. If it's a, like, I am going to, I see a bird flying a mile away. I'm going to shoot it down. Well, okay. I'm going to give you a, a 35, but some people have enough bonuses that can make that happen. So like, the probability varies, and different systems use different things too. Like D D and D is a D twenty system, but not every tabletop uses D twenty. The way you you want to frame probability depends entirely on what kind of game you want to run. Uh, I know many games that use uh, only D tens or only D sixes, and it's just different amounts of probability depending on the kind of story you're trying to tell. Yeah. So um, as much as D and D is a game of storytelling, there's a chance uh, element to it uh, where things can go awry. Right, and that's part of that's part of great storytelling in general too. And I think thank you for that explanation, Josh. That was wonderful. Um, I think mechanical. <laughs> I think I think um, that's part of what we enjoy in D and D. It's not just our successes that make the story great; it's our failures. Yes. Um, it's part of life, and and this is supposed to be an uh, emulator of how life operates, or our fantasy life would operate. Um, so succeeding those successes and failures is so cool. Um, and I'm, you know, it makes it a game. You never know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't be so fun if you succeeded at everything. It where's the, mm. where's the chance? I've had to have many talks with players who think they can get away with fudging dice rolls. Oh, oh no! Oh yeah. When you're <laughs> when you're running with kids, it happens all the time. Oh, <laughs> that's so cute. <laughs> no, it's not. No, okay. Yeah, I'll, 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 you would know better than I. Uh, yes, but kind of moving on from there, I just wanted to explain why we showed the funny cool goblin rocks um so and as we eat one <laughs> might take a while to digest that one um <laughs> let's talk about uh, our first experiences into tabletop role-playing games and uh how that turned out for you i mean obviously you liked it enough to stick around but um let's start go with shantae i know you kind of went off with it first um but like you were trying to get into it and a bunch of guys were like eh. Yeah, so I first encountered D and D in high school, so that was about a decade ago. Nobody judge me, um, and <laughs> no judgment. Uh, and when I uh, initially encountered it, I did ask, you know, would anybody be willing to teach me? And uh, you know, it was a group of guys, and they weren't super interested in teaching anyone, which I understood on one level because when you just want to play a game, you don't want to have to teach a complete newbie uh but uh it was also um more so you know we don't really want to play with a girl here so i know right yeah. so um i encountered it again in community college and we would have there'd be a group of people that would play during in the cafeteria during the lunch hour so people would just be in there playing it and um I didn't really have the time then to invest uh, in it as much, but uh, just this last year, uh, I had a friend who had been mentioning, hey, you know, I'm a DM, if anyone's interested in learning, because he wanted to start a new game, and I jumped at the opportunity, I got London in, I got my sister in, <laughs> and we all started learning together, and it's it's been really great to be able to have an excuse to see everyone every other week. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Oh my gosh. Yes. First encounters. So London, was that also your first encounter into D and D then? Um, my first encounter would be with the, the current DM that we play with now. Um, okay. I mean, I've obviously heard of D and D seen D and D in cultural contexts. Um, but yeah, in terms of playing D and playing D and D myself about a year ago, um, about, I guess about a year and a half ago, maybe. Um, and this, just life changing, just and like the idea that like you wouldn't like want to teach someone how to play is just like it's kind of like I don't even know how to like think about that because like it's so complicated. You should want more people to play, but you you, you got to show them to the water. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I honestly I love new players. Like they're, they have no expectations. They have no limitations normally, or they, they put limits on themselves, but once they realize that they can do pretty much anything, they go. And it's yeah. so wonderful to see that growth and everything. So and it's new personality. Yeah. Be something that you're not normally, you know? Yeah. That's absolutely that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's your chance. Do it. Mm -hmm. um, Josh, what was your first encounter? Uh, my first formal encounter with tabletop role-playing games was, I think I was, 10 or 11 and uh, my 
we I was in like my local library and like at the table where they like sell a few things and they had the first edition starter set for Dungeons and Dragons. Ooh. Uh and I don't remember if it was my mom's idea or my idea, but I picked it up and uh the next year I had a D and D birthday party where I like ran a game for some people and I can't imagine it was very good, but I guess I guess it stuck. Um and, and then I wouldn't start playing like on a more consistent basis until I was like halfway through high school when I finally found some friends who were actually interested in playing like 3.5 and then uh, of course I tore grew from that but if you want to go even earlier than that uh, I used to play it wasn't we didn't have dice we didn't have anything formal I didn't know tabletops existed yet but um my brother and sister and I would play a game we called unpause in which they pretended to be Pokemon trainers and I uh, kind of they told me what they did and I told them what happened um, and then whenever we whenever we had to stop playing like, okay pause the game which is how I got the name pause because then when we play oh. we would pause and then whenever we whenever we kind of just got too far and they got too their Pokemon were too strong we we're like oh well, we're just gonna restart and I didn't realize back then that that was role playing but that's what we were doing um, and so it was always just sort of like it was always sort of in my blood whether I knew it was gonna be there or not but formally uh, Dungeons and Dragons first edition. Love that. Oh my gosh. You went all the way back to first edition. That's, that's brave. <laughs> I didn't know it was brave at the time. <laughs> no, but, but looking like having done a little bit of research into Dungeons and Dragons, that's a, that's an era in and of itself. First edition when dwarf was a class. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Dude, that's that's right. gosh. Wow. Right. It's gone oh, a long D &D. way. Oh yes. <laughs> yes. And we'll get into that in just a bit. Um, but I want to bounce off of something uh, London just said, actually um, culturally, uh, D and D has been presented in many different ways, um, and some of them weren't necessarily so good. Um, back in the eighties, we did have the Satanic Panic, um, and D and D kind of caught the brunt of that. Uh, they got, hey, oh my gosh, they're fighting demons and and all. Oh, they other gods. What's this? That can't be right. And so uh, D and D was painted as evil and and satanic. Um, would you say we'll start with London? Would you say that D and D is evil or satanic as it was pictured out to be? No, but I think it's a different way of storytelling, and I think that there are so many ways that the media tries to control the way storytelling occurs and how it happens, especially if you're going back all the way back to the eighties. Right. And just to give an analogy, you know, like when you think about the, the beginnings of what the internet was, right. The internet was, you know, something that universities use primarily on the East coast to communicate with each other. Right. And so the, they're talking to each other and the government's like, wait, hold on. You guys are having all these conversations about all these intelligent things and we're not in this, so we have to figure out a way to get it <laughs> into this, right? And so just to use it as like a slight analogy, it's like you're sitting down at your at your table with you know five of your friends and you guys are telling a brand new story. And that story could be groundbreaking in some different ways in ways that people don't normally see or understand storytelling. And so I think that that's where that comes from. It's that there's something on the outside that, that, that they are disconnected from and therefore it is different from them. And therefore, as we often do in culture, we say the other is bad. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm -hmm. I was, love that. That was, thank you for that insight. Yeah. That was it's really good. a great perspective to hear that. Yeah, I love that. Uh, Josh, what about you? Do you think D&D &D is satanic and, and worshiping Beelzebub? Yes, next question. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, think, I think it's a... Uh, London put it very, very well. But I think it's uh, it is evil only in the sense that many people paint things they don't understand as evil, just as many organizations uh, and many uh, kind of branches of religion have painted things they don't understand or don't like as evil throughout the years. It is in that sense. Um, and in that sense, I embrace it. Let's go. Like, fight the power. Let's do this. But um, otherwise, of course not. No, it is it is an outlet for storytelling and creativity. Uh, it, is a, it is a place where you can express yourself and uh, be with friends and... Uh, work together i don't see how something like that could be considered evil mm. yeah absolutely shante what are your thoughts well i will say that uh i want to start kind of with a, a comparison here because D, D is very much a fantasy based game and for those of you who love game of thrones i have some bad news that's <laughs> fantasy based <laughs> <laughs> Got uh, so you know <laughs> just comparing those two they're they're i'm not going to say they're the same exactly because they're not 
But it, they're based within the same genre, as is, you know, J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, which I know many people have read and loved and have watched those films. So, I mean, just to give a little bit of context, if D&D is evil, then so are all those other things that I just mentioned, which, of course, doesn't make any sense. So, I mean, no, <laughs> it's not satanic or evil. It's just it's a game. It's not that serious. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would even go so far as to say, like, if you would want your uh, religion to be involved, you can even do that mm -hmm. um, because there are many ways to show support. Yes, it might be under a different guise or a different name, but there are characters who are even priests in the game mm -hmm. who travel around and they can spread the word. And like you could you could make a Bible uh, RPG, t tabletop RPG, right? And just go with that if you wanted to. Like, is that not what church is? <laughs> You said it, not me. Um, but, <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's just, it can be whatever you want it to be. It, D and D takes the route or tabletop RPGs take the route that you as a player and a, a dungeon master or storyteller decide to take it. And I think that's the beauty of it. So yes, thank you for all those answers. For those of you worrying that we were worshiping Satan while we were uh, playing these games, I can't imagine anyone would be watch have watched this far and still like been like, "I'm I think this is evil, but I'm gonna see what this is all about." <laughs> and never know. There's Poor always thing. one or two. I've learned what that from too. Yeah, um, but since we're on the top of culture, I'm, I'm skipping around these questionnaires here, but uh, I want to talk about how D and D has become popular recently. Uh, despite the satanic panic and kind of going into like the dark ages there for a hot second, recently it has come into being as a superpower in uh, the gaming world. Uh, we see this in the form of Critical Role, who, uh, if you don't know, Critical Role is a worldwide phenomenon. Um, they have literally taken over. They are getting their own animated series. They have a comic book. They have their own merchandise that they sell around the world. They literally have shops in the UK uh, Australia, Canada, like the U S they're worldwide here. Um, and like they have literally taken over, sold out entire theaters for 500 plus people just to watch them play this game, uh, for four hours. Uh, and it's, it's truly an experience. So, um, what what are some shows? I know Critical Role is the big one, and then we have like Dimension Twenty, which is another great example uh, done by College Humor. If you've ever seen their stuff, um, and Dungeons and Daddies is another one that I know of. I haven't really listened to it as much as I want to, but it's fun and it's a cool name, so I stuck that in there. But uh, give us some examples of something that you watch or listen to and that you really like. It can be one of those or something else. But let's start with Josh. Uh, to be clear, I just want to add this because I have heard of it and haven't listened to it yet. But the full title of that podcast is Dungeons and Daddies, Not a BDSM Podcast, which I think is a terrifically wonderful title. Uh, I love that the clarification is in there as part of the title. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I had questions, to be honest. <laughs> I just yeah. Um, I do. I used to listen to Critical Role. I don't anymore. I just haven't kept up with it. Uh, I'm catching up with Dimension Twenty now because it blows my mind. I love it so much. Uh, the main one that uh, I have, I again, I'm behind on it. But the uh, it's tough when you when you have um, as much D and D as as I do in my life to stay excited about other D and D. Um, Dimension Twenty has really filled that need for me because it's still mm. still very fun, even if you take the D and D out of it. Um, but back in the day, I also listened to the Adventure Zone, which was a huge yes. inspiration for me. Love the Adventure Zone. Um, it is a uh, it features the McElroy brothers and their father uh, just playing D and D together, and it's just so funny and so good. It's a great example of like. You know, this, these are all really good examples of like how we were talking about like D and D is art and can be in different ways. Like Critical Role is like just people playing D and D for the sake of playing D and D. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Adventure Zone is like it's a comedy podcast with D and D as the backdrop. And whereas Dimension Twenty is like a TV show, effectively just where they play D and D as a backdrop. And all these different ways, these different forms of art are just—it's so cool to see. But uh, yeah, I think that's—I think it's it. I don't think I really watch any other media aside from the ones I mentioned. Love that. Shantae, what, what about you? What do you consume D&D &D wise? Uh, well, before I actually started watching D&D, &D, The Adventure Zone was my like first real introduction into the mechanics of the game. Um, and I will say, going a step further with the art part, uh, they actually have come out with a couple of um, uh, graphic novels that tell the story of each um, 
each uh, game that they've played within Dungeons and Dragons. So I, we have the first one, there be Gerblins. Uh, <laughs> we need to get the other one. But um, yeah, I also used to watch uh, D20 Babe on YouTube. It was a group of um, five women who would play Dungeons and Dragons. And I think they're on Twitch now, but um, I haven't kept up with them too much. But it's a reminder to get back into that. It was a fun one. Hmm. Love that. All right. Something else to look up, adding these to my list. Um, London, what about you? I haven't heard of any of these. Oh! Like, like, like I've heard of Critical Role, yeah. but I have not listened to it. Um, I think I obviously knew that it's D&D based, but I've never like watched it. I've never gotten into any of any of these things that you're talking about. Although, um, would, would you call it D20, babe? Yes. That sounds awesome. Yeah, yeah. Dimension 20 is pretty, pretty cool as well. Um, they have a lot yeah. of different themes to their games. Awesome. I think just the idea that, like, yeah. you could get a group of people together. And that's kind of what it sounds like, at least with Critical Role, it's people who are playing D&D and everyone else is listening to it or watching it. Watch yeah. What happens. I think just the idea that, like, that's a thing, that you're going to watch someone else play D&D for four hours. I mean, it's a yeah. testament to how exciting it can be if you know what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I spend most of my time... When I'm thinking about D and D, um, <laughs> thinking about my character, my character's development, you know what their backstory is. I mean, we're getting ready to start a whole new campaign this coming Sunday, and so I'm like wrapped up in all that. Um, and so, but it sounds like maybe I have some 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 education to to get into for myself. Yeah. I mean, but that's the nice part too. You don't need to have encountered any of these things to play D and D. Mm -hmm. Like they're just they just happen to be great examples that are out there. And like, if you're not like, hey, I don't really have anyone to play with, and I'm not sure if I want to do that, you have plenty of sources and resources to watch and learn from um, mm -hmm. because it is such a community. Um, I will say it's not for everyone, obviously, just like any other thing in the entire world, but. Hey, it's a great uh, way to listen to a podcast for a couple of hours and and have it on in the background. You get a whole story, brand new and fresh, um, like you're not like nothing else that you're gonna expect because there's it's six different people telling the story, and so it could be something else entirely by the time you finish the four hour episode or whatnot. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, and if you want a great example of what how how D and D can be both entertaining and also literally any story you want in spite of its fantasy or in, uh, nature, I do recommend starting with Unsleeping City with Dimension Twenty yeah. because that is so incredibly progressive. It takes place in modern day New York, but also it is a fantasy story, and it will blow your mind. It is, is entertaining from beginning to end. Every character, everything about it is just like you. I would bet people who like have hated D&D &D their whole lives even if they didn't like D&D &D, would like and would enjoy that it's just so much fun it's mm -hmm. so good i'm literally only two episodes in but <sighs> i need to i need to continue something because it gets so much better i know i know and the dm on that is just so good so um definitely uh if you're if you want to look for something they're out there just mm -hmm. thought we play that for you guys right now mm -hmm. um but so since it's in modern society um things uh we've grown as a society and as a culture in very recent years and i'd like to take a moment to talk about that um because D, D specifically has always found its niche with people who have felt marginalized i feel um and underrepresented um there are multiple reasons for that like because you can be somebody else in some of the world and be um represented in any way that you see fit and you can continue that story um and I know uh, there's also been some hindrances on that side, though, too. Uh, recent talks about um, how races, specifically in D&D, how races um, have like different modifiers, like elves are just better at being smarter. But why? There's no reason for that. Like, um, so D&D uh, has its faults and everything. But let's take, a, let's take some insight from you guys on what you think are some positives and negatives about um, marginalized groups and how they can flourish or how they've been underrepresented in uh, D and D. We'll start with Shantae. Sure. I mean, some positives is something that we've really talked a lot about in terms of being able to, to be who you want, you know, um, without uh, a binary of any kind in terms of gender or sexuality. Um, you know, th none of those things exist within this world. Um, and 
some some negatives I think would be just the fact that I'm gonna I'm gonna be a little bit of an English major here right now, but uh, you know, a lot of fantasy uh, definitely exists within you know from English mythology and lore, and as a result, it centers whiteness. So unfortunately, a lot of the times, if you look at the very first edition uh, of the player handbook, some of the descriptions have some really racist overtones, I would say, um, and that has kind of seeped into the foundation of it. And so that even now in, you can find some problematic ideas, you know, elves are pale and they're good and orcs are, um, you know, dark skinned and they're bad. Just immediately that binary is still happening. Um, and that's kind of where some of the problems tend to tend to happen. But it is getting a lot better. Uh, they released a new handbook, I think, last year. If Correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've updated some of the descriptions um, and they're doing more of the work. Of course, there's still a lot left to do, but they're doing a lot more of the work to really make sure that that centering of whiteness and those racist overtones are slowly kind of being taken out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's um, it's definitely a work in progress mm -hmm. and it, it's not going to be done until we hear from those marginalized communities about uh, what they need and want in this game because it is a game for everyone and therefore everyone needs to be heard. Exactly. Um, so thank you for that insight, Shantae. London, what about you? Um, I think <clears throat> Shantae said a lot of what I was thinking about in terms of like how you only see like one type of story in the sense that, you know, it's, it's elves and orcs and dwarves and it seems to focus on like that, what we think of as like, you know, European fantasy as opposed to other types of fantasy that you might find in other types of the world. Um, but I think like on a very basic level, because I mean, when I think about D&D &D, before a year ago, before I really got into it, I think about seeing D&D &D on television. It's always like a nerdy group of kids who only have themselves as friends. And they're like, they're like loners, which kind of really doesn't make sense because they obviously have each other. Um, but like they're being pigeonhole that's just being like these really nerdy people and i think that the the negative to that is that it, it excludes other people right mm -hmm. and so like you don't have to be like this one type of person to like D, &D right you can be anyone and you can like D, D. you can be anyone in like storytelling um and i think that once you get into D, &D once you experience D, D, you understand that and I think that that helps you grow and it helps you become more confident. And I think that confidence is one thing that you need in D&D &D because you can't play D&D &D modestly, you know, like you have to have confidence in what you're doing. Even if your character is modest and not confident, you have to be able to portray that confidently or else it's not going to come off the way that you want it to. And it's not going to benefit the story in the way that it should. Um, and so I think that, I would say that the, the backdrop to the sorry, the backdrop, the the negatives to D and D would be that like there's a very limited view of how we view D and D in terms of how we view fantasy, but I think that it allows people to become more confident um, and understand that there are other ways to tell stories and other people who can play D and D. Mm, absolutely, yeah. Thank you for that insight, London. That definitely, um, yeah, that's a great way of thinking about that. Uh, Josh, what about you? Um, I think I'm probably the last person who should be speaking on this as a cishet straight white guy. Uh, I feel like I'm like the, I was the target audience when D and D was created. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the, everything you guys said is beautiful and very, very true. And it's great that it's becoming more aware that there are problems inside D and D you're allowed to love something that is problematic as long as you acknowledge that the problems are there, knowing that there are these, um, tropes of like how equating one race with another and having them be, uh, oblig obligatorily evil, uh, and seeing that there, uh, and being able to acknowledge that and go, okay, well, we know this exists and now we can reject it. Uh, all I can do as a DM is make sure those notions are rejected and make sure that awareness is spread because like yes there's there's uh, a lot of anti-semitic undertones as well there's a lot of like stuff like that that goes into it uh, very blatantly too uh if you look back in like any interviews with like gygax who made dnd or tolkien where so much of fantasy is based off of there's a lot of like really problematic stuff in there mm -hmm. but i think beyond all of that is that there's a lot of unintentional at least from the player standpoint, but not not the companies. Some unintentional gatekeeping, um, where 
you know, even in the sense of like, you think about D and D when it first came out, it was just a guy creating something that he loved. And so there was a book and then there was maybe another book and then you pay $10 and you can play the game. And now if you like, if you want to like get in with a group, well, most of the people are going to have like seven or eight books, each one that costs like 50 bucks. That's there's a hundreds of dollars, which you can spend on this. And some people might see that and be like, well, I can't afford that. I'm not doing it. And that's like, it's really like unintentionally classist again, unintentionally from our point of view for a company, which of the coast does absolutely want to make money. And, uh, I'm sorry, Wizards of the Coast, if you're listening, but I support pirating all of your books because you have too many books. Um, you're not wrong. Because in, in, in my mind, if you want to be truly inclusive to everyone, and again, I really am the last person who should be able, who like can sway in on this, but if you want to be truly inclusive, you need to make sure that you not just allow everyone to play, but give the resources that everyone needs to play. Um, because if you, if you provide resources that are more readily available for some people than others, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, the access is different depending. Yeah, to go along with that, what, what I'm surprised that hasn't happened over the last year, because I mean, I think there are probably more people playing D&D &D since COVID-19 has happened, is, you know, one thing I recently found out is that Fortnite is free. Yeah. And the add-ons are what you have to pay for, right? Mm -hmm. so imagine if like D&D, &D, whoever creates D&D, &D, if they created a platform, the video chat platform, where you could play D and D and like you were charged in other ways for having to use the service and the materials themselves were free, you know, that yeah. makes more sense. But release, I guarantee you if they release the player's handbook, monster manual and dungeon master's guide for free, people would still buy the other books. I would, yeah. I would argue they would get more sales on those other books now because other people would then be like, Oh, these books are really cool and have really cool art and really cool ideas. What else you got? Uh, that would be great. That's a cool idea. Yeah. Red Letter yeah. Wizards of the Coast. <laughs> hey. Wizards of the Coast, we got an idea. <laughs> you're not going to like it because you're capitalist bastards. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> hire, me, hire me first, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, but yes, all these are great ideas, and I, I, I want to thank you, Josh, uh, because as a DM, you do have that opportunity to uh, remove some of those barriers that have been put in place. And um, I know you as a person would actively try to remove them. So, um, yeah. It's... Yes, I know. I know you don't feel like you should speak from that place. But however, thank you because you you are actively fighting against it. So, I and mean, everywhere I can. Yeah, and that's. I mean, that's honestly that's where it starts. You know, you have to you have to start with what you got. So, um, and hopefully it just keeps going, and uh, we keep these ideologies flowing about. Hey, this can change. Let's do that. Mm -hmm. uh cool but let's um let's move on to a little bit of a lighter subject we've talked about a, a couple of heavy ones now in a row but um in those last couple of minutes i just want to talk about how we do uh D, D currently uh because uh we are in the middle of a pandemic and also all of us are in different places Ooh. um however shantae and london play together uh josh i'm assuming you play with people around the world probably right Mm -hmm. It's mostly in the East Coast, but I do have uh, a West Coast group as well. Yeah, I mean all these, all these different things. Um, so, uh, the internet is a wonderful place that has a uh, bunch of stuff. So, uh, let's talk a little bit about how that operates. Uh, Josh, what what do you use and how do you play currently? Um, so I'm uh, surprising, considering I've been doing this for almost a year digitally now. I'm surprisingly old fashioned with it still. Um, I use Zoom. Uh, I have a tripod set up with a camera that connects a, like a separate camera to the zoom call. And I point that at physical battle maps on my table. Um, I, my digital art skills are worse than my regular art skills, which are bad. Um, so I just sort of, I will, I have Sharpies and I like draw out maps. They're not special. They're not like fancy. They just kind of get the job done. They let people see where they're going to be. Uh, I do own roughly, and this is, this is going to sound exaggerated. This is not an exaggerated number, but I've owned roughly 700 miniatures. Um, so I try my best to sh at least display what the players are actually fighting and have miniatures for each uh, player. Um, <laughs> the day I learned I could write minis off as a business expense was a dangerous day for my bank account. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, and anyway, um, so I will do that. I'll, it's all still analog there. Um, 
and I just do do it via Zoom. I was playing via Skype and then I had Discord for a bit and Discord really, really didn't work for me. But it's mostly just because my computer couldn't handle it. Um, mm. Discord itself is a fine platform. Um, but Zoom is, has been the most consistent for me and all my players to work. And it's just, it's that simple. We do a Zoom call. Uh, you can whisper to people if you need to whisper. You can like send private direct messages. Um, yeah, it gets the job done. Uh, nothing too fancy. I know... Um, one of the DMs I've hired uses, actually two of them use D&D Beyond, one of them uses Roll20. Mm -hmm. um, all sorts of resources are out there for it. Yeah, definitely. But mostly what you do is still theater of the mind, which... Uh, um... Well, I do actually, all all battles are on maps now, unless it's like a one-on-one -on -one that like I wasn't expecting. If there's something I can have, I will at least have a map with minis. Everything else is theater of the mind, though, yes. Yeah, which, I mean, is such a is such an idea. Like, you have to keep track of everything in your head. Um, I know when we were playing... Uh, we would, everything was in your head. And I, mm -hmm. I had a perfect picture of what I thought was going on. I'm sure your picture was different, but you know, it was all in our heads and, and we just, you just kept telling the story and I had, you were so apt at describing it. I was just like, I still have vivid memories about these things, Josh. I just want you to know, I have both dreams and nightmares about our <laughs> sessions. Just saying. You're welcome. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, London, what about you? What do you use as platforms? How are you playing right now? We use we use Discord. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we use Discord. Um, I feel like when we first started playing, we had lots of issues with Discord. Yeah. We've been disconnected. But I feel like lately we haven't had any of those issues actually. No. Um, Discord's kind of cool because you can like you have like you can have like a music channel. Um, our DM is really good about having like the ambiance and yeah. you know the whole music going and like he's got like the different songs for the different moods and the the fights and um so and then he's also really good about i mean the, i think the really the thing that's really great about rdm is that he writes all of his own material <laughs> and so um i'm sure he's not the only one but i mean i feel really lucky to have a dm like him considering i've never played uh, D, D before um so you know he's got all of his writing material there's maps a map for everything. Everything is drawn out. Everything is explained. It, it all works out perfectly over over Discord. Wow, I know. Um, you just mentioned music, and I love having music in my games um, because you know the moment the DM changes the song to something else, you're like, "Uh oh, what happened? Where are we? What's going on?" <laughs> so true. You stepped into the fog. My oh. heart starts racing every time. Yeah. Like, oh no! Like, Why did the song switch so abruptly? What's happening? Exactly. It's just so funny. Your mind starts oh, racing. Uh, no, that's funny. So, uh, Chante, I'm assuming you use similar. That's what you use also then? Yep, Discord. It's It's been working really well for us. Um, and we do use Theater of the Mind for the most part. We When we played in person, Jack had a whole setup. I mean, mm. he was... The man was prepared. So uh, he had all sorts of miniatures uh, as well. So I will let him know, uh, Josh, about some of the amazing opportunities on your on your end there. And um, right now it is mostly theater of the mind, but he does draw uh, his own maps for a couple of uh, really important setups that we need to go through. So actually, I can show you one of them. Hopefully it shows up. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. So this oh, is one man. of the maps he sent us. This is for... Um, Camp Meek Mook. This is our first campaign. Um, uh, well, we were, you know, quarantined, mm. and uh, he sent that to us, and I had to draw it out because, you know, I I keep a notebook of D and D, so I needed to have it on hand so I knew what was going on and where we were. So you can look at uh, it whenever you need to. <laughs> exactly. It came in very handy when everyone's like, "Wait, where are we on the map?" So I was always in the know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You're the good note taker, then. I am. I am. The player yeah. that's like As it. always. Yeah. We did something last time. Yes, notes. Notes. <laughs> yeah, you take notes more notes than I do. I'm the dungeon master. Look at that. <laughs> I also DM and I keep no notes. I'm an awful DM. <laughs> no. I keep a few. I keep sparing notes. How? Most of it sticks up here for some reason. Oh, good for you. Same. Mm. It just it just happens. I started taking notes a few months ago. <laughs> yes, Josh. That's, that's impressive. For how we, many games you're running? Yep. Uh, I had one or two uh, mix-ups where I would say one thing and the player's like, what? I'm like, oh, wait, that hasn't happened for you guys yet. I'm going to start taking notes. Oh, my God. <laughs> I don't know how. I don't know how you guys do that. I can't do it. <laughs> it's, it's wild, I tell you. I got I got the one campaign, luckily, so I can keep it all up here. But, Josh, I don't know. Whew. Yeah, wow. That's playing a dangerous game, man. Mm -hmm. That's I, play, I, I play nine dangerous games. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. 
Uh, cool. Well, we are winding down here a little bit and I want to make sure we get to the last 10 questions that we normally end our streams with. Um, it, but before we do that, is there anything else you guys want to mention about, uh, tabletop RPGs, maybe like how people can get involved. Um, just like what, what your, any thoughts about why anything like that? Let's start with Josh. Uh, for all of the uh, talk we've had about D&D, do not be afraid to look for other tabletops. I guarantee yeah. you if there's a topic that you like, Google that topic, tabletop. It's out there. It exists. Uh, drive through RPG is a great resource. Um, you can usually get the PDFs for a really cool tabletop for like 10 bucks. Really easy access. Find the most important things, the people you're playing with. The system's not nearly as important. And quite frankly, if I must, might get on a soapbox, I do not think D&D is even in my top 10. <laughs> Yes, and that's completely fine. Again, just like he just said, there's a tabletop RPG for everyone. Lord knows I would love to try more. It's just most of the people that I play with are set in their ways, unfortunately. Yeah. I'll find another group sometime soon. I'm hit, me up, hit me up. I know a guy. Do you now? Oh, interesting. <laughs> Is that um, your sister? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, same guy. Um, Shantae, what about you? What do you want to say to people? Uh, I would say if you're interested in D and D, I I would wholeheartedly recommend watching. Um, oh, did I freeze? I froze. Yeah. Well, that was smiling. Like smiling. You're smiling. <laughs> as long as you can hear me, that's the important part. Uh, yeah, if you're interested in D and D, I think starting with those YouTube channels that we mentioned, uh, Dimension Twenty, Critical Role, I think those are wonderful places. If you're looking for tabletop R RPGs, then um, actually there was uh, one hosted by Will Wheaton on Geek and Sundry called Tabletop. Uh, so he, he tries out all sorts of tabletop games to go give you some insight of what's out there. And that's a great place also to maybe find something new. Yeah. I love that you're frozen with a smile though. <laughs> right. This is great. Uh, London, what about you? Uh, my advice would be is that if you're even slightly inclined to play D&D &D or any other, you know, TTRPG, but specifically D and D, just because there's so much, I don't know, cultural lore and what's the I'm looking for? Like, like it seems so heavy if you don't know what's go what, what's going on. If you're like somewhat inclined into playing it, take the chance, take the leap, do it, and you more than likely will not be disappointed. Mm -hmm. Love that. Yes, all these things are true. Um, I'm I'm. Oh, there goes Shantae. She'll come back in just a hot second here. There she is. Hey, hey. I'm it. back. <laughs> um, but yes, so um, if you're interested at all, feel free to reach out to either Shantae or I or, or Josh. Uh, we'll, we'll um, if you want to, we can post information. D and D for hire, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's we great. can. You can reach Josh through there. Um, any of us are open resources for any of you interested in uh, what we're what you're looking for, and we can help point you in the right direction or at yeah, least get I, you started. I may or may not have a PDF version of the handbook. Yeah. <laughs> Burn it down. Tear it down from the inside. That's right. Um, but let's end tonight with the final 10 questions. Uh, these are the questions that uh, James Lifton would always ask uh, during his actor studio sessions in NYC for many, many years. So, uh, Shantae, you've done these questions before, right? I don't think I have, actually. Okay, cool. Yeah. So it'll just be the three of you. Okay. Uh, I will not be answering these ones. But if you guys could just give... Um, Quick answers to all these. We'll get through and and uh, just see where this takes us. Any any answer is correct. There are no wrong answers here. Uh, I think that's so a challenge. <laughs> we're gonna go. Uh, let's go, Shantae, Josh, and then London for each of these answers. Cool. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. All right, Shantae. What is your favorite word? Uh, I'd say my favorite word is appreciative. Josh. Dirigible. Yes. It's really fun word. It's a good it one. Is. My favorite word is blatant. Bling. Mm. I like it. What is your least favorite word? Moist. I was going to use moist. I, I don't really have a least favorite oh, word. I like all words. Um, so uh, something bad. Any words said with bad intentions. Let's do that. <laughs> get get okay. it. Almost. Almost. Ooh. All right. Oh, I like that. Deep. It's yeah. uh, a lot of unfulfilled. Getting heavy. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, what turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? A uh, bookcase crammed with books, definitely. Uh, anyone passion? Anyone's passion about anything? Mm. 
complex storytelling. <laughs> I just yeah. want complex storytelling. It's why I don't watch movies. I only watch television shows. <laughs> Same. Oh, I get that. Uh, what turns you off creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Um, willful ignorance. Mm. My own anxiety. <laughs> oh, no, Josh. <laughs> the mood. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Probably... Probably the exact opposite of what I said. Just like stories that aren't fully fleshed out. Like there's, I, for, to me, there's nothing worse than watching something and then getting to the end of it and being like, I need more of this. And there only being like a little tiny bit of it. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> uh, what is your favorite curse word? Oh, I'm so sorry, parents. Uh, fuck. It's definitely my favorite. Fuck. <laughs> yeah. It's so versatile. Word. Holy shit. <laughs> nice. Yes. All right. Uh, what sound or noise do you love? Um, I would say uh, cracking open a can of sparkling water. Sparkling water. Yeah. That's really, really good. It's a good one. Uh, rain and Wookiees. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes at the same time. I love it. <laughs> the Last of Us soundtrack? <laughs> Ooh, that's good. Yeah. We'll take it. We'll take it. Uh, what sound or noise do you hate? Uh, I'm going to go with a classic here. Nails on a chalkboard or any kind of scraping on a chalkboard. I can't. I can't. Mm. Uh, teeth on a fork. Can. Ooh, yeah. Cannot. Mm -mm. Scraping metal. Like it's metal on metal. That can you. Like, Lots of scraping happening here. Not no. <laughs> Uh, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Is traveling a profession? <laughs> yeah. That'd be great if I could just get paid to travel. <laughs> do it, do it. Uh, Twitch streamer. Actor. Yeah. All right. Yeah. If only we could all get paid for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> what profession would you not like to pursue? Uh, anything heavily focused on customer service? Uh, any nine to five. Understandable. Anything that has to do with hurting people. Mm. 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 Good answer. I like that. Uh, and the last question, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Um, I'm going to switch God to my ancestors and I would say we have so much to tell you. Yeah. Um, I would like to hear, sorry about, about all of that. That was your personal test. None of it was real and real life is coming up now. <laughs> no. Because <laughs> that's the only, in my mind, that is the only thing that can justify how much bad stuff happens in this world. <sighs> Natalie Portman will see you now. <laughs> and with that, I would love to end this. Stream. <laughs> what a way to end the day. Oh my, oh my goodness. Thank yes. you, Brendan. I appreciate that. That yeah, was amazing. <laughs> Please. Thanks for having us, Alex. Yeah, no, this has been great. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I know Josh has got a piece out here. You got another engagement. So I'm going to go to solo screen here and uh, have the rest of you guys in the background. Um, yes. So I just want to let everyone know we have lots going on with Ubisoft Arts, though. Um, thank you to all my guests so much for coming today. It was fun talking to all you. I just want to uh, take you all through what's happening and what's coming up here with Ubisoft Arts and Culture, especially in March. Uh, we have Poetry Hour coming up. Notes from the Field. This is the first Wednesday of every month at 5 p.m. Uh, we have an open mic on the 4th. Uh, sorry, the Poetry Hour is on the 3rd. Open mic on the 4th, which is uh, Spoken Word and Poetry Prose uh, with Tom Galvin. We have our Veterans Pop-Up Art Cafe event on March 6th, uh, 2 to 5. Uh, make sure to check that out. It's going to be uh, virtual to produce a virtual creative arts event with an emphasis on mental health and wellness of veterans, active duty family members, caregivers, and community members. Super important if you are involved with vets at all and you know a vet, which I'm sure all of us do in the Yuba Center community, uh, please reach out and let's be involved and uh, support them in this way. Uh, all about the arts talk show every other Sunday at 4 p.m. 
uh, this upcoming one is going to be with Alex Maserold, the director of Applause Kids, and then we're going to have one with Diane Funston, our uh, current poet in residence at USR Arts and Culture, uh, the host of Poetry Square. So uh, make sure to check your calendars for that. And then, as you were just watching, Artist Alchemy! Hey, hey! Every Tuesday. Every other Tuesday. Not every Tuesday anymore. Every other Tuesday at four. Uh, next up, we have Susan Allen and other members of the Race Dialogues Project on March 9th. On March 23rd, we have uh, Robert Hay Haycock, a retired cur curator and ex exhibit ex installer at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. That sounds super interesting. Um, so please check out Ubisoft Arts Cult Arts and Culture uh, Facebook page for any more information. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, it has been a blast talking about something that I've been super passionate about uh, for many years now. And from all of us at Ubisoft Arts and Culture, stay safe um, and remember to love each other. Bye, everybody. <laughs>